Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to this new webinar uh, jointly organized by EBBF and the Wilmet Institute. EBBF uh, is Enterprises Building a Better Future and uh, has been uh, at work for 30 years to open meaningful conversations regarding organizing the workplace with a more value-based and uh, behind-fired um, set of values. And uh, um, today, the main event we are uh, participating in uh, jointly with the Women Institute is the um, talk by Roya Havan, uh, titled Rethinking Materialism from a Feminine Leadership Perspective. And uh, just so that we know, have a little bit of a background about uh, Roya, <clears throat> it's important to mention that uh, Roya currently serves as a professor and director of graduate studies at the Department of Mass Communications at St. Cloud State University. And she has previously served in a number of leadership positions, including as a VP for International Marketing at CBSC in China, and as a chair of her academic department in Minnesota. Dr. Ahavan's research in the field of mass communication extends into a range of related areas, including international affairs and peace studies. Her most recent work is a book entitled Peace for Our Planet, A New Approach. So it's interesting to know that Dr. Ahavan is a frequent speaker on global issues at national and international forums and radio and television programs. And uh, maybe most interesting of all, she has lived and worked in four different cultures, quite different cultures, Persian, American, Japanese, and Chinese. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Roya, we're all ears and very happy to have you with us. Thank you so much, Fahid. I appreciate uh, your kind introduction. And hello, dear friends. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak with you. Um, as you can see, the topic of my talk is rethinking materialism from a feminine leadership perspective. And to put that in some context, I'd like to start by mentioning that the current global pandemic has exposed more than ever before the shortcomings of the existing economic systems across the globe, particularly the persistent extremes in wealth and poverty within and among nations. One of the root causes of these extremes is the greed-driven materialism that continues to characterize human life across the planet, both at the individual and systemic levels. This pandemic has also provided us with an opportunity to pause and think about what kinds of economic systems we might want to replace the current unsustainable and collapsing structures with. And what kinds of leadership characteristics, particularly in the business arena, are likely to lead us away from these materialistic systems toward an economic order that can ensure material prosperity for all. Today, I would like to take the next 20 minutes or so to set up a framework for this discussion. And I look forward to getting into more depth on each of these points during the question and answer period. The first thing that we need to do in this discussion is to define some of the terms I have just mentioned. Materialism and material prosperity, and to clarify the differences between the two. At the individual level, materialism can be defined as a mindset that focuses on amassing wealth for the purpose of satisfying personal desires. Now, while all human beings clearly have a necessary and legitimate need for material and economic well-being, materialism goes far beyond this need. 
to view the pursuit of an insatiable appetite for material acquisition as the main path to human happiness. In addition, the materialistic pursuit is based on the assumption that as human beings, we are atomized and disconnected entities capable of leading a meaningful and rewarding life on our own. And that it is completely logical for us to engage in endless competition throughout our lives and aspire to live in gated communities locked away from the misery of others. In short, the materialistic mindset is self-centered, competitive, greed-driven, and uncaring. But the phenomenon of materialism is not simply limited to the individual consumer's mindset. It is also a major problem at the systemic level. Despite the growing constructive global consciousness in the last few decades about the need for what has come to be called moral capitalism, and also the millennial generation's natural tendency toward global solidarity and their support for socially responsible businesses, which is a truly hopeful sign of our times and one that I have um, written and spoken about previously, the main thrust in business leadership today continues to remain largely on values that are greed-driven and uncaring. So it is becoming increasingly clear that in order to mitigate these glaring extremes in wealth and poverty, we need to educate and lead our way out of the materialistic mindset toward the mindset that can ensure material prosperity for all. <clears throat> so what is the definition of material prosperity? Within the material prosperity paradigm, okay, I, <laughs> I'm a little bit behind on the slides. So there's the materialism. Um, within the material prosperity paradigm, human happiness is seen as being anchored in the ability to make a positive social impact while also pursuing one's own personal growth. A major assumption of this paradigm is that as human beings, we are incapable of experiencing true joy if we are constantly surrounded by and witness to the deprivation and suffering of others. In other words, the moral prosperity, the moral material prosperity paradigm rests on the realization that we are all interconnected and we are all one. It is an organic and system-based way of thinking about humanity as one body rather than as an atomized and disconnected set of individuals. So unlike the self-centered propensities of the materialistic pursuit, the search for material prosperity is motivated by a desire to promote shared prosperity within a system that provides sufficient resources for all human beings to fulfill their potential. Instead of focusing on a constant, often aggressive competition to get ahead and score a win, the material prosperity paradigm upholds such core individual and systemic values as justice, compassion, caring, and collaboration to produce win-win outcomes. Now, it is very important to any discussion of um, 
the material needs of human beings, so to speak. To point out that nowhere in the material prosperity paradigm is wealth itself seen as undesirable or suspect. The key question to be addressed is not the intrinsic value of material wealth per se, but rather how it is earned, how it is used, and how it is distributed. In fact, the proper expenditure of wealth in the service of collective prosperity can actually become a means of achieving spiritual goals and aspirations. So if we accept the material prosperity paradigm as the superior solution to the welfare and happiness of all segments of human society, the next question becomes, what are the changes that are required in corporate leadership models and values that would enable us to shift from a materialistic paradigm to one that is capable of promoting material prosperity for all. One might argue that the most effective business leadership model for facilitating a transformation away from materialism and toward material prosperity must embody itself the compassionate and caring communal values that are inherent in the material prosperity paradigm. Interestingly, since the 1990s, the scholarly literature on the topic of business management has continued to emphasize the need for moving away from the old management mindsets toward new leadership models in the interest of greater employee, job satisfaction, and optimal corporate productivity. In these studies, new leadership models incorporate such communal values as caring and nurturing, and place the emphasis on strengthening the quality of human connections within organizations. As Fairholm, one of the pioneers of these studies has put it, and you can see on this slide, a key characteristic of old style management is the extent to which it is keyed to a money standard. In the new paradigm, leadership is caring for people. If we closely examine the research literature in this area, we will find that the progression from the old management to the new leadership paradigm has corresponded with a shift from characteristics that have traditionally been identified primarily with the masculine aspect of the human species to values and orientations that have traditionally been associated with the feminine. This shift has included moving from influence through exercise of legitimate power or position to influence through persuasion or personal networking, from competition, play hard, to cooperation, play fair, from individualism, for me and by me, or by me and for me, to collectivism, team first, and exclusionary, divide and conquer, to inclusionary, 
power sharing, and a sense of family. So, um, as Eagley and Carly, another set of researchers, have also put it, modern characterizations of effective leadership have become more consonant with the female gender role. Also a series of industry studies on effective leadership undertaken by McKinsey and company have concluded that those leadership behaviors more often applied by women reinforce a company's organizational performance on several dimensions. Note that these studies do not say categorically that women are better leaders than men, but that leadership behaviors more consonant with the female gender roles and the leadership behaviors more applied or more often applied by women lead to better organizational performance. So it is certain leadership behaviors and characteristics that produce better performance, not necessarily the gender of the person displaying them. In addition to the values I have just discussed, it is important to point out that another very key characteristic required of a true leader is having the moral courage to articulate, uphold, and consistently behave according to core values, even when it is difficult to do so. So it is the moral courage, for example, to uphold justice that is of paramount importance in this leadership profile, not toughness per se. This is a crucial point to make in the context of a topic which has traditionally been reduced to a soft versus tough dichotomy with the tough side having been given the higher value. It is important to point out that although clearly the historic socialization of women may tend to lend itself more readily to embracing a caring, nurturing, morally courageous, and power-sharing posture in leadership, both men and women are fully capable of exhibiting such leadership values. And so I would restate the conclusion of the scholarly and industry studies on this topic as follows. In our contemporary 21st century global society, the primary attributes of an effective leader, whether male or female, reflect traditionally feminine characteristics. So, the key question becomes, how can we make sure that men in leadership roles are more readily willing and allowed to express the caring and compassionate aspects of their nature? And at the same time, allow women to become leaders without having to first give up their feminine orientation toward caring and compassion in order to fit into the dominant patriarchal corporate culture. As of this moment, we can see some hopeful signs of progress in this regard. As I have mentioned, leadership literature began to encourage this shift in empirical terms in the early 1990s. Since then, the constructive collective consciousness about this issue has continued to grow to the point that in the last few years in particular, we have seen the rise of many 
women political leaders internationally, some of whom visibly embody these feminine leadership characteristics. And some, like New Zealand's Jacinda Ardern, are successfully institutionalizing the concept of ensuring citizen well-being in place of the traditional drive to increase GDP in planning their national economic strategy. In addition, we are also beginning to see examples of male leaders who are more open to leading with empathy and care. Justin Trudeau of Canada comes to mind, for example. We also have increasingly em more em empirical evidence about the effectiveness of these approaches in improving both national reputation and performance. And of course, these days, we continue to get new data every day about the better performance of such leaders in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. But the corporate arena tends to, of course, with some exceptions, lag behind in embracing these behaviors. Despite the effectiveness they have shown in achieving that most coveted corporate prize, namely long-term and sustained productivity growth. The clear reason for this, of course, is the persisting dominance of traditionally hierarchical and rugged, quote, male characteristics in corporate management habits and models. So, as in every other discussion about positive social and economic change, the ultimate question becomes, what can each one of us as individuals do to facilitate the achievement of a more just and equitable economic system? Obviously, this is a vast topic for reflection and discussion, which I hope all of you will participate in. To open up the discussion, I would like to take a moment to once again emphasize the importance of the role of men in promoting compassionate and caring leadership models. Often, the hegemonic hold that patriarchal mindsets continue to have in almost all societies across the globe tends to relegate the discourse on any topic that somehow touches on gender equality to a separate realm as a quote, women's issue. And that in turn tends to at best push men into a spectator's role in these discourses. Yet clearly the enterprise of bringing more compassionate characteristics to the fore in corporate leadership is very much a men's as well as a women's issue. So consistent with the core values of shared material prosperity, it is important that we adopt inclusive frameworks that emphasize the oneness of humanity in all of our discourses. And I hope that today's discussion will provide us with some inspiration and conceptual tools to carry into meaningful conversations on this topic in both our personal and professional lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roya. This was uh, really fascinating to uh, listen to and learn from. And uh, I'm sure uh, people that are uh, interested in this topic will be looking at your talk for uh, many years. 
because uh, this is an issue that, of course, we will not solve within the next um, two or three months. But um, so one of the aspects of your talk that I thought was particularly interesting and, and the last few ideas you mentioned was that this is not a women's issue. This is a humanities issue, and certainly men cannot be just spectators saying, okay, well, um, we hope you solve this somehow. This is a joint affair that we all need to work on, uh, all of humanity, I mean. So a few questions have come uh, from the, the webinar, and uh, perhaps questions will also uh, pop up on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, friends that are watching on the different uh, social media, on Facebook and on uh, YouTube, are welcome to ask questions uh, on those uh, on the chats uh, within those different um, channels, but I'll also uh, share with you a couple a couple of questions that came directly from the webinars participants. Uh, one is from uh, Colette, and um, her question uh, says, "Do you believe that individual materialism precedes or stems from the more global materialism? How do you look at that?" So inspired by the Baha'i perspective, which of course you can see running through everything that I shared today, um, I would say that um, the individual and the system are sort of mutually interdependent, right? So anytime we um, are talking about making change, we have to think about um, both because uh, it's it's a sort of a, a feeding loop um, but I think that um, as individuals we can be the starting points in other words we are not sort of helpless you know to say okay well we you know we live in a, in, in a materialistic system and that is the way it is um, because um, actually it's this really comes to also our vision of, of the nature of, of human beings. Who are we? What are we? And if we um, think of ourselves as, as spiritual beings, um, then we can see that we have a great sphere of influence as spiritual beings um, and that our actions can, even as individuals, can have great uh, systemic repercussions. Um, so I think that we do need to change the system and the individual is definitely not separate from the system. We do live in a materialistic society which is bound to be influencing us. But because we are self-reflective um, spiritual beings, we can um, sort of make the decision that we are not going to allow that system to shape us and that rather we will call upon our agency to change the system. Yes, and uh, it, it might be uh, one of those traps of the mindsets we are living in that we are just uh, feeling as victims, powerless to change anything. And so uh, this is an important perspective. We can take agency and make decisions, at least for ourselves, maybe our immediate circle. And right. our children, in, in, in educating our children, boys and girls, yes. So precisely, we have a, a question uh, from Shahla uh, that uh, states or uh, asks, how does behavior of parents at home uh, contribute to the education of children and bring about more of an equality of sexes? I think that is extremely important. You know, the, the example that we set and how we teach our girls and boys. And, um, Education and awareness is extremely important on the part of parents, mothers and fathers. Um, so you were talking about system and how, uh, and I acknowledge that we are shaped by the system. I briefly um, referred to the idea of the hegemonic uh, sort of 
hold that certain mindsets tend to have on us until we actually start questioning things and becoming aware of them. So, for example, when, when something has a hegemonic hold, it, it becomes internalized by people in a way that people would act in ways that would hurt them because that is the way they have internalized things. For example, when a mother says, oh, boys will be boys, right? Or in, in the developing countries, you know, mothers would abort their girl child in, to give preference to having a boy and so on. That is, these mindsets do have, unfortunately, strong hegemonic holds on us. And so the, the first step is to become aware of them, both as men and women, ourselves, to, to start really thinking about and deepening about, um, you know, how can we um, come up and with a new model and, and, and of course we have that model, but how can we, you know, start to internalize new ways of thinking and also acting. And then it, it becomes then extremely important to treat our boys and girls equally um, in terms of one of the very, very um, troublesome uh, areas that there's increasingly more research on, but I don't see enough awareness of it, is that, you know, the way that we bring up our boys is, is extremely harmful to our boys <laughs> and not just to women. For example, the, you know, since a boy is very young, we, we tell them, well, boys don't cry, right? Of course, all human beings have every emotion from um, fear, sadness, vulnerability, love, um, and, you know, shame, uh, joy, you, you know, we, we all have these feelings, but of course there's also anger. What emotion do we give boys, young boys, from very young age, the license to express? We don't allow them to express any emotion except one. And everyone knows what that is, right? We allow them to express anger and we teach them that it is okay to express anger through violence, that it is manly. If you show your anger, <laughs> you punch the person in the face, then you're a man, right? So these are very, very harmful um, things that are truly institutionalized in, in, in the training of boys and of course girls, and I could go on and on, uh, but I just wanted to mention that example. So yes, it's extremely important to become aware ourselves and then um, act with respect for equality of genders um, within the family and also uh, teach by example and bring awareness. Great. Thank you so much. Those are, uh, yeah, uh, again, discussions that uh, probably requires a few weeks to explore in one's lives and, and, uh, and discussions for the, the future generations. We have a number of, of questions uh, that are piling up, so I want to share uh, another one. Um, which says, will the recent examples from Arthur, will the recent examples of women political leaders managing the pandemic more effectively than many male leaders help to bring about change in business as well? Can you see uh, some parallels or some applications of what we're learning by uh, in concrete oh. examples? Yeah. Um, yes, I am very optimistic actually. And um, 
I think we are all already seeing some examples. The issue is I'm not sure we have as many women leaders in business as we should have, or leaders in business, man or male or female, who are truly adopting these. But I am seeing some examples. One recent article I read was um, of this about the CEO of Patagonia, who, of course, Patagonia, I believe, is a B corporation. So it's a little bit different from the sort of stock market um, type of businesses. Um, but it was very impressive how she, I think his, um, her name is Rose Macarina or something like that. I'm sorry, I don't know her actual last name, but, um, you know, the way that they um, closed up early and, and in, in the article, she was insisting on the fact that the most important thing is for um, the company to keep their employees safe. And that's the top priority um, for the company. So I, and I know of other business leaders, even personally, who um, I'm not sure they want to, might need to <laughs> mention their name, but um, who are, you know, striving to, to adopt these models and, and they're men. Uh, so yes, I am a very optimistic person. In fact, in the book that you mentioned in introducing me, Peace for Our Planet, A New Approach, I um, talk extensively about the fact that um, there has been a very strong, constructive, um, global consciousness and process moving forward in the world in the last 200 years. And um, that this is gaining momentum. And um, it's interesting that whenever there is a crisis, this consciousness tends to show itself more brightly. And so we are living through one of those moments, I think, in history where uh, there is this um, global collective consciousness emerging, which should help in changing a lot of behaviors um, including in corporations, because, um, you know, without their workers and without this kind of collective system thinking, I think even achieving the business uh, goals will not be uh, possible. Great. Um, Tapia now asked a question that I think uh, segues very well which is uh, you have explained that there's a new paradigm that's emer emerging and apparently more and more uh, coherence around this new um, look at leadership. Do you think there's something similar uh, that's applicable to the notion, the concept of power? Is there a, a new concept of power that could emerge, that could replace the current one, maybe based on domination as uh, the, the key thought behind it? Um. You know, I think that, uh, of course, you know, that's, you have opened a really huge area of discussion. Um, yes, I think the answer is yes. The, you know, for example, this goes back to the 90s where um, the idea of soft power, for example, came up as opposed to the hard, you know, military power. So that's one change that has happened. And um, I think that as humanity moves toward realizing its oneness, for example, during the current pandemic, you know, if we don't, let's say we get a vaccine, if we don't vaccinate everyone, if we leave one person who is not vaccinated, everybody will can be potentially reinfected, right? So we, we are, I think, moving forward to, toward greater realization of our oneness. And that is within a paradigm that is more um, spiritual and therefore will shift the idea of exerting power to service. And in fact, in the uh, leadership studies that I just mentioned, 
um, that started um, in the 90s. And, um, you know, there, there have been concepts of leadership that specifically talk about leadership as service. So, yes, these, these ideas um, are swirling around. Yeah. And, and, and might call us, yeah, might call us into uh, a need to redefine what we mean by power and, and how we apply it. And Martina, yeah, I, actually, can I just say because you brought up power, I this is um, something that stays in my mind from from a wonderful book, uh, I believe it's by John Hatcher. That this this is a paraphrase, but the 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 only legitimate use of power is to establish justice. So <laughs> that's a nice way to look at it too. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, Martina is asking, um, can you uh, possibly share any practical tips about how to change the system in particular the corporate system? So uh, maybe one way to approach that question might be, uh, what do you think are the priorities when engaging with uh, uh, corporate leadership? What could be the priorities to um, help establish this new um well or not maybe not new but this different uh, paradigm or this different approach to leadership with uh, the more feminine uh, characteristics or feminine assigned characteristics so i think again this is a really large um you know question and it has many different aspects but i think what comes to my mind immediately is that um it is very important for everything that we want to see in the world to start to exhibit ourselves. You know, as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, right? So um, it, it's very important, for example, in, in our workplaces um, to be caring, to, um, you know, it depends on what, what it is that we are doing, but for example, you know, avoid backbiting, um, lift other people up. And um, there are so many other behaviors. Also beyond what we ourselves uh, provide as an example, I think in boardroom discussions or in meetings, there is a way of approaching um, discussions that can focus on bringing people to the idea that certain choices are not just moral, but they also reflect enlightened self-interest. So for, for example, you know, bosses or other people who, who may not be at a point where they, they would be so open to readily say, okay, what is the moral choice here? Um, to show that it is in the interest and how it is in the interest of, of a company or corporation or whatever organization to, to really um, put the emphasis on the employees and the stakeholders. You know, one of the concepts that comes from <clears throat> the Baha'i faith and is discussed by Abdul Baha is profit sharing. Profit sharing is, is a great example of how, if we can get to that point of taking that first step, it is a moral approach. But once you do it, it gives a great stake to the employees and it you know, increases productivity so much because you know, people, have a stake in how the company does. So that becomes, it's moral to do so, and it is a spiritual step, but it can also be a self-interest, kind of enlightened self-interest step. So I think maybe that's one of the ways that we can approach um, the topic in a way that might be effective initially. Great, thank you. What are some examples of uh, feminine behavior or modes of representation that uh, might be considered as problematics? Um, and uh, perhaps because they are imposed by the hegemonic systems, 
that uh, make us confuse maybe some characteristics as being feminine necessarily. Can you uh, speak to that? So maybe some of the misrepresentations, let's say, of feminine. I'm I'm not quite sure what exactly this question is getting at, but um, I think that whenever you have a system that has inherent in it a prejudice against any group, right? Um, it will automatically focus on certain behaviors of that group as being um, generalizable to the whole group, right? And so let's say that, um, you know, I, I've obviously been in, in both corporate and, and educational systems for a very long time. And um, let's just take one example of, you know, gossiping, right? At the workplace. I have seen that, that behavior equally engaged in by my male and female <laughs> colleagues, which I try to avoid. I always try to, you know, change the subject. Um, but for whatever reason, this may be more attributed to women than men. And I think that's because of a pre-existing um, sort of bias. So it all comes down to, I think, um, a sort of the way that we have internalized certain things. And uh, I would say that, um, you know, one of the most important things that we need to do in any kind of um, awareness raising is to make sure that we know that individuals um, will always be individuals and they're very different. And the worst thing that we can ever do is to categorize people. And that's why I, even in this presentation, I have made great effort to say that, you know, we're not talking about a category of women and saying, you know, all women are going to be great leaders or men are not, you know, that it, we are not, we are talking about. And so it is, we have to always avoid this kind of generalization because that is the habit of mind of the old world systems, right? Everything becomes divide um, and then sort of pit two groups against another. It becomes a competition. It becomes, you know, which one is better? Which one is superior? And that is the kind of mindset that we really need to hopefully get rid of in our society if we are going to move forward. Okay. And that actually connects very well with Morgan's question. She um, asks if you could please speak to the unlearning we need to do when we've had centuries of habituation um, regarding um, uh, how we work and how we engage with labor, uh, probably paid labor in this global economy. So how do we go about unlearning? I think just having asked that question is a great starting point um, to know that we must unlearn and why, right? Uh, it is not going to be an overnight process for sure. Um, but I think that um, maybe the what is happening um, in the world today might bring us a little bit closer to gaining a better consciousness of the problem <laughs> with that kind of you know way of thinking because um, for example, we, we are 
able to now understand a little bit more what kind of work adds value, true value to our lives. You know, whose work uh, is valuable? And uh, what, what is, um, you know, just some sort of superfluous economic activity? And so I, I think it will take me a very long time to answer this question, but I think just asking that question and being able to see examples and, and raise consciousness within ourselves and others as we're doing in, you know, in this discussion, I think is a great starting point. Great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and uh, um, unfortunately, in uh, one hour, we will not cover all of it. <laughs> but uh, I, I, as you say, I think uh, awareness is the first step, and that can lead to discussions that uh, we can have in our homes with our friends and uh, with larger group. Hopefully, um, there was a question from uh, Constanza that I think you've uh, already at least partially uh, answered, but uh, worth asking is. Um, when we discuss uh, this idea, this approach about equality of men and women, um, and we um, don't focus on women, are we uh, like segregating the conversation to put the focus on just one group and not uh, making the right consideration regarding the, the other half, uh, in this case, the smaller half of uh, humanity? So if we are only putting women on the stage as the ones that are responsible to achieve equality, uh, how does that lead the conversation or uh, try to lead answers probably? Um, if I understand the question correctly, this does connect to something I already mentioned that um, all of these issues that we talk about are human issues. Um, I think that the fact that, you know, many years ago, uh, people started to talk about <clears throat> what has come to be called women's issues was a good start. But I think that um, in the 21st century, it makes no sense to talk about, quote, women's issues. There is, to me, there is no such thing. <laughs> this is about humanity. And so it is, um, you know, women and men and boys and girls, it's, it's humanity. This is, that's what we're talking about. It's the prosperity and well being of all of humanity we're talking about. So um, I think that um, we need to become more aware of that and, and bring everyone into this um, conversation. And also from a spiritual perspective, let me say, um, it is important to remember as souls, we do not have a gender. You know, we only in this physical existence, we have a particular physical um, attribute, you know, physical gender, but um, as souls, we do not, you know, we, we do not have a gender. So um, we really need to operate as spiritual beings uh, in a way that honors the nobility and innocence of all souls who are, have been created in God's image. And, <laughs> it doesn't really matter what their gender is. So um, with that, I think that connects to uh, Glaucia's, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, question. Uh, she uh, underlines that uh, the majority of women still juggle near, nearly 75% of the unpaid work required to run a home and a family. And uh, how do we address that situation, that lack of fairness of, uh, of balance? if uh, women are systematically put in charge, to put it very mildly, uh, of the unpaid work of making a homework. 
Yeah, that, that is a, one of the really important economic issues that we have to really address globally. And it, it, remains, a, it's a, it remains a major challenge that, that women everywhere um, carry the, the largest burden of work. And I, I can go into so many things, so many studies by the United Nations and International Labor Organization and you know, so there is there is a lot of evidence on this, and I think that again it comes down to the whole uh, system that has been set up to um, glorify um, only and and give value only to the things that men have been doing, and not to the. Um, you know, equally or sometimes more valuable things that women have been doing. And um, so I think it, it again goes back to changing the way we think. So of course, you know, we need to work to establish more equitable laws and policies. But I think in the final analysis, it, it does go back to, um, giving equal value to, uh, to the work and, um, and just existence of women uh, as we do to men, yeah. Thanks, and again, this is a, a deeper question that will need a, a lot of talks within our homes and of course in, uh, in society. Um, maybe we can uh, spend the next few minutes uh, with concluding remarks. Um, I was particularly uh, interested in this idea that some key values seem to be emerging that you mentioned, such as justice, compassion, caring, nurturing, strengthening those human connections. And um, maybe you could share with us um, what do you think could be key strategies to um, make those values, values emerge ever more in the corporate environment? What kind of uh, spaces do we need to create to um, foster the emergence of those qualities? I think, um, you know, in, in, like in everything, um, we have to begin to have discourses and, and conversations. So with our colleagues, there, there will always be um, things that come up um, in, in the workplace. And I think to, to get deep enough into understanding these issues so that we feel comfortable um, holding meaningful and compassionate discussions with others who may not actually think the way we do. I think that is really um, something that we have to develop. It has to do, because I, I work in the field of communication, I will end on, on that point, is that communication cannot happen if there is any hint of an adversarial position. So in fact, when we hold debates, we are wasting our time, basically. Because what we have is people coming into a discourse or a discussion with already held positions and just trying to defend those and nothing really gets accomplished. But I think if we can start having these conversations in, in very compassionate um, ways, then that, that would be a really an important starting point. And I know that's just, again, there are several questions. I've only touched on the starting point because to give a full answer is, um, you know, it's not really possible, but I think at least, um, I hope that all of us, we will um, go away from the discussion we have had today with, uh, more enthusiasm and more interest in in having meaningful discussions with our family, friends, and coworkers. Yeah, thank you so much, Raya. This has been a, a great discussion. I think it has uh, planted the seeds in in our minds, and hopefully, will carry the seeds 
and uh, nurture their growth in the organizations, the family we, we all live with and live in. So uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us this uh, knowledge and, and uh, hopefully the, we'll, we'll take it in, in, uh, as a wisdom that we need to apply to our daily exchanges and uh, our corporate strategies as well. So thank you so much. Uh, again, thank, thank you much. to the uh, Wilmet Institutes for um, allowing this co collaboration between EBBF and um, uh, the Wilmet Institute to, to work. And thank you again, Roya, for uh, this great presentation and food for thought for a few hours, a few weeks, maybe a few years, a couple generations, uh, so that we can uh, make this world better for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Take care. Thank you.